This podcast is a presentation of Chapel Valley, a community church. More information from Chapel Valley can be found at www.chapelvalley.org. All right. Well, say it's great to be here. Um, we've been going over, we've been talking about defeating the wolves in your world. I think Spirit of Fear would, I wouldn't call Spirit of Fear a wolf. I would call Spirit of Fear weakens a person to make them vulnerable to the wolves. Wolves, in my estimation, as we see them in Scripture, are, are teachings that prey on weaknesses of people to lead them away from the truth. That puts them on a path to either earn, their, earn God's grace, um, earn God's mercy, uh, p- creates systems of abuse and, and misguidance, and the, Jesus faced them. The church always faces them, but a healthy body, a, a church that is strong in its doctrine and strong in faith is, is not prey to wolves, because wolves prey on the weak, right? They, and they look for opportunities to hunt and come after you. I mean, that's just the nature of a wolf. And so you, very seldom do you see lone wolves. Wolves don't want to be alone. They want to pack up. So these false teachings pack up and, and look for vulnerabilities in us. And so in Romans 8.14, as we talk about strengthening ourselves, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So to be a growing son and daughter in the Lord is to develop a, a, a learning of how to be led by the Spirit. And, so, and not by men or women, but by the Spirit. And then men and women who align themselves with the works of the Spirit become guides and teachers and things like that but we want to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit bears witness with us. And so we talked about the three voices, the inward witness, the inward, uh, the inward voice, and then the voice, the external voice of the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit works with us. And we all three have those available to us. And for the last few weeks, you can review them. I'm not going to review them. But, I, but if you haven't heard them, I would invite you to go to the website. They're there. And um, I, they're meaningful. So... You're welcome to check them out. Jesus was the ultimate shepherd and wolf crusher. Okay? He was the ultimate shepherd and wolf crusher. He understood how to protect the sheep. He spoke truth. And he spoke truth that was full of grace. And grace is God's enabling influence to live in truth. So Jesus spoke truth, not as facts. He spoke truth that was filled with grace so people who heard it and responded could live in the truth that he proclaimed. And that's a wonderful thing. So we all want to be not just truth tellers, we want to be filled with grace as we dispense the truth. But Jesus faced legalism. We went through that last week. I mean, you look at the Pharisees, they were very legalistic with how they did things. Uh, Jesus faced justified carnal impurity. That's a doctrine that's moving into the church, even now as we speak. It's this justification of, well, you got the presence inside, so you can live like you want. It doesn't matter what happens on the outside. And that is not our commission. Our commission is to house the presence of God on the outside, too. So it's not, we all make mistakes, but we don't want to justify our mistakes. We want to bring them to the Lord and have him strengthen us. And you'd say, well, when did the Pharisees do that? When they set up that woman to be caught in adultery so they could accuse her, they were using sin and a vulnerable person to make a point. And they justified it as though it was okay. And it's never okay. That was not the heart of a shepherd. That's a heart of a wolf that it would throw bait out there to, and in a form of a person in order to entrap somebody. He also faced an ecclesiastical hierarchy where they walked around in robes and pious prayers so everybody would notice them, so everybody else knew they were little people instead of, instead of able to come to the Lord on their own. And then profiteering, definitely selling lambs. Jesus even called, my temple became a den of thieves. You just... You're making people, you're extorting them. You're making them pay exuberant prices because you're saying their lambs aren't good enough, so they got to buy temple lambs at 10 times the price so that they can get forgiveness of sin. That's profiteering. We, that still is in the church. We still, you know, if you sit at the front table, you get the anointing. The back table, sorry, you know, nothing back there for you. Do you earn God's presence or his interactions or... Uh, you know, if you're not setting up tables and chairs, then, you know, don't call me because if you don't have time to serve, then we don't have time to minister, that kind of stuff. It's that profiteering. The, 
grace is freely given, freely offered. Jesus didn't turn down anybody, but he did bring ministry, but it was but the and development and discipleship, but it was for anybody who showed up. He wasn't penalizing people for not showing up. They were rewarded for showing up. So there is a reward to pressing into the Lord, but there but there's not to be any imposed penalty. But today, I want to talk about how did Jesus come to the place where he was impervious to wolves and was able to walk into their territory and be a shepherd? And what, 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 what really happened with him? And a verse that kind of hit me a while ago, and I think some of you are interested in it, it comes out of Luke 2.52. And it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now this, is, this verse has tremendous implications. Jesus increased, so we see him gro growing in these areas. He increased. He wasn't born with them. He was developed. He increased in wisdom, and I think these are in a proper sequence. He increased, not like I'm, you know, I'm giving the scriptures my okay or something, I just, but I think they were in, written intentionally with this sort of a progression. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So let me highlight these four words real quick. Increased. This, when I looked this up, it shocked me. It is to lengthen out by hammering. So you picture getting a block of steel and hammering it out into a sword. Goes into the fire, comes out, gets hammered, goes back into the fire, comes out, gets hammered. Increase in Jesus' walk and relationship with the Father came by him being hammered out. Doesn't sound that fun, does it? Hammered out, lengthened out. He, became, he found his form and his usefulness, and he was lengthened out through hammering. That's what increase was. Wisdom. And wisdom, it's interesting to get this definition nailed down because you can tell by the multiplicity of de definition how hard it is to define it. So I picked from here and there, and I think I came up with something. So I'm going to offer it to Webster's Dictionary and see if they bite on it. But wisdom, intelligence made evident in meaning. So I can know facts, but if I don't get why they exist in a collection together, I don't have the ability, I'm not wise about it. I don't have the wisdom on that. So I could say every Tuesday, the stock market goes up. I, I know that by observation. Now I'm just, this is an example, okay? Then I could say every Tuesday, it rains. And then bad wisdom would say, well, if it's Tuesday and it's raining, the stock market's going up. And if it's not raining, then it's not going to go up. That, that means I don't have my, my intelligence through observation does not, did not come up with good meaning. So wisdom is that I, my experiences and the things that I acquire and what I know comes together and it's beyond understanding in the sense, because understanding is I want to know how they relate and stuff like that. But wisdom is I, I get the meaning of it. And then stature. This is another good one. Stature shows up in the New Testament only a handful of times. And a lot of translations when Jesus became of age. But when you look at the uses of the word stature, it's not age. It comes with age, but it's not age itself. It is an attained state made fit for a thing. An attained state made fit for a thing. That is stature. So it brings with it the implication of, of, um, of sort of building an edifice. In fact, the message, the title is an edifice for glory or an edifice fit for glory. So we'll talk more about that. And then favor. Favor is the same word trans, that is grace. So grace and favor in the New Testament are the same Greek word. And I just come up with the definition as God's enabling influence. It's just the best I could do is get a paragraph definition. But what it is is that God shows up and starts exerting his influence on a person. And with that exerting of his influence, he gives the ability for that person to follow through on it. And therefore, they're changed by grace. 
And it's God's will working in a person until there's a yieldedness, but then he also gives the capacity for them to respond. So you're saved by grace. Because five minutes before you got saved, you probably didn't want to. And God came in and exerted his influence to where you're like, wow, I ought to get saved. Or I really need to get saved. That's God influencing you. And then he provides the means where all of a sudden it's like, I need to, I need to go tell somebody. I need to get saved. Would you pray for me? That I acted that out. So he, he worked in me, I acted it out. That's grace. So Jesus had the grace, the favor of God working in him. As God influenced him, he pulled him in. So Jesus becomes this edifice of carrying God's presence. And if I were to rewrite Luke 2.52, I would write it like this today. In a Talk to me in a month. Maybe I'll change it. And that's the luxury of rewrites on my end. I can grow with them. But I would write it like this to help me understand it. God's enabling influence caused Jesus to be hammered out with an intelligence that captures the divine intent, making him an edifice able to carry the full weight of God's presence. I don't know if you, don't, if you didn't hear it or <laughs> kind of got that look like a, okay. God's enabling influence caused Jesus to be hammered out with an intelligence that captures the divine intent, making him an edifice able to carry the full weight of God's presence. If you don't have stature, you can't carry God's presence. What do you mean? We hunger for God to come. I want, I want to interact with him. I want him to confront me. I want, I want to walk out of there saying, that was God. That wasn't me. That was God. And I want to be limping out of the situation. Just say, that was close. That was God. It wasn't me. I encountered something and he won. You know, that's it, God's presence. It's, it's his ability. If God came right now and just literally just swept across this floor and poured his love into our hearts... I mean, the absolute love that he has, it would probably ruin us. We, we, would, we wouldn't know what to do with it. We'd, we would just be overwhelmed by it. So he, he builds us and builds us and builds us so we can carry more and more and more of him. It's not a matter of being saved. His presence is in here. I am his, he is mine, and when my body gives out, I will be with the Lord. That's not what we're talking about. Jesus was saved the moment he was conceived. He was a child of God. He was a child of God at 12. If he had died in a fishing accident, got tangled in a net, and you know, didn't work out, he would have gone to heaven because he, he, was, he already had the life of God in him. But he didn't, carry, he didn't have the stature yet to carry God into situations and never abuse God's presence, never be abused by God's presence unintentionally, and never be for sale. He had a stature that allowed him to do exactly what God wanted him to do. So he grew in stature, and he, and he grew, he increased in wisdom. He understood God's intent with all the life experiences he was going through. He knew that God was fashioning him. So when he was 12 years old and it was in the temple, and his parents scolded him for not following them, he got it. And it says that he submitted himself to his parents from then on. He allowed himself to be hammered out because he understood God's intent of fashioning him to have the substance to carry God's presence. Where if, where if a six-year-old, you know, I can be an adult, but really immature in my spirituality, and God shows up, what happens is, and we see it, and it happens to me. I'll be here, and I'm worshiping God, and all of a sudden, I just, I'm like overwhelmed, and I'm starting to weep and something like that, and then something that is of God comes around, but I feel like it's interfering with me. I'm worshiping God. I'm having a moment here, right? And, so, and then all of a sudden something's going on. Now, I, I don't have the stature to live within this moment because I don't have the flexibility to do what God is also doing. I'm overcome. Now, we need to be overcome because it's hammering us out, but a good worship service is not just that I was overcome and then get inconvenienced by everything else. 
It's where I, leak, I can flow with what God's doing, and it's not dis- making me a wreck. I can move with God. I can, I can carry the gift of faith and deliver it into a situation mixed with working of miracles, and somebody is miraculously healed, and, and I can then move on and pray with a, someone from the children's church and just and be all good and not like be all creepy on them because I just had this moment, bam! You know, it's just, I can relate. That's stature. That is being able to flow and function with the fullness of God without being tormented or tweaked or overcome by it. None of us are really there yet. I mean, honestly, none of us are even close. But the Apostle Paul said, I'm pressing in, I'm pressing in, I'm pressing in, and I'm not there yet. But we want to come to that point where, where we grow in stature, where we carry more of God's presence. That is why God doesn't show up in one day with all his fullness. He has to build us to house him. It's really true. It doesn't mean we're not saved. doesn't mean I don't have him, but there's more of him. I get stretched and enlarged to carry him. So Jesus increased. So I want to talk about that just a little bit, and we're going to give a couple examples, all right? So it's more than age. Matthew 6, 27, when Jesus said, Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Which of you who, by worrying, can add even a little more substance to your stature? Well, obviously the answer is no one. Worrying doesn't build you up. It tears you down. So, and, and it has a matter of carrying promise, carrying vision, carrying hope. And worry undermines my stature. So I want to put away worry, get hammered back into faith, and grow up in the Lord so I can carry the full weight of what he's promising and what he's intending to do. And I submit to the process if I have the wisdom of God working, because I understand his intent in this moment. So we want to increase in those areas. Another verse is John 9.21, when the guy got healed by Jesus and the, and the, the Pharisees of the day came and said, um, well, did Jesus heal him or what? And then they, being great parents, says, well, he is of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. What they were saying is he has the appropriate stature to bear the weight of your inquisition. Now, it would be nice if parents kind of stood by their per- person. I don't know. But what they were saying was, he has the capacity to endure your questioning. Ask him. He is of stature. It wasn't just saying he was old enough. He was mature enough to handle this. So the idea of stature has to do with uh, strength and substance. And I'm picking on stature here right now. But now this is really interesting to me. Hebrews 11, 11. This is the Hebrews 11 is the hall, you know, the hall of faith chapter. And it says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength con- to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now we know in Romans, uh, I think it's 4, yeah, where it talks about that Sarah was past childbearing years. So God really did do a miracle in bringing forth a child in her. And so uh, in that idea of that um, she bore a child, that's sort of, those words are kind of added to this text, and then they translated it, she was past the age, because it's just the idea was when she was past childbearing years, Sarah received strength to conceive seed And she bore a child when she was past childbearing age because she judged him faithful who had promised. But if you take the words that are are there in in just the simple Greek words, and I'm not here trying to make a big Greek defense of the scriptures at all. This doesn't change anything. I think it just really releases some things. The word past here is the word kairos. We've talked about that word. It's an appointed season. Spring is not a kairos time. Spring is a chronological time. It comes every year. It's predictable. We know it's coming. Um, in fact, uh, the basketball tournaments that are coming up in March, they're not even Kairos. They're Kronos. They're just they're predictable. It's going to come. March Madness. We're headed that way. But if all of a sudden in your life there's a season that comes where, where you every time you go to the bank, they give you free money because you're the 1,000th customer, and then you win a raffle and you get a new car, 
and then you find money on the ground, and you say, that was the best week of my life. Everything worked out for me. Well, what was that time like? Then you would explain it. What was that kairos like? It was an unscheduled, but not, not necessarily not seen, but it was an appointed time that isn't necessarily repeatable. It just was for that time. So that's kairos. So uh, Jesus came and, he, and said to Jerusalem, Oh, if you had only known the hour of your visitation, but it's lost to you. He says, if you had only known the Kairos moment that I had come to you, it was scheduled, but you didn't see it, missed it, and it's gone now. So Kairos is like that. So when it's saying, when, when she was Kairos, when that's, it's not past Kairos, it just says when Sarah was in that specific time, something happened. So and then age is stature. So when she was in a, in a kairos stature, she bore a child. So my last rewrite, my last dabbling with the scriptures. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive. And when she was in the specific time of attained fitness, because she judged him faithful who had promised. When she, had, when she had moved into the specific time of attained fitness, that's what released her faith and put her in Hebrews chapter 11. Here's my proposal to that. We oftentimes get passive about God's promise, thinking, well, God, it's going to come to pass. At the end of the age is going to be the harvest and the church is going to be dynamic and moving miracles and all that stuff. Well, that's going to happen. But the question is, will I be a part of that church? And I will if I press in to recognize the time, God's intent, how he hammers me out so I can come to the attained status, this, the attained stature to carry the presence that he will release in this end time. So it's not a passivity that allows this to happen. Sarah wasn't passive. I mean, she had moments and she struggled, but the time came when an angel visited and said, in a year from now, you'll have a child, and she believed that. She, she got it. She got the intent of her life. She got the intent of her trials. She got the intent of what had happened. She realized she had made a mistake when she asked Abraham to sleep with his, the, someone else and to bear a child. She... she she was messed up. She didn't get it then, but now she got it. And when she came to the point where she got the intent of God and positioned her by faith, she came to the place, that season, that moment of, a, of attainment to carry God's work in her. So my whole point of this message is Jesus grew to the place where he attained a stature that God could fill him with all the fullness of deity and then he could go and do everything that God asked him to do. And God is calling us in this time, and it's not this church, I mean it's the church. He is calling us to press forward, to allow him to hammer us out. By the way, that's another word for that is discipleship. That I, I'm not just a learner, I am participating in obedience God's asked me to do something, and the spirit of fear is keeping me from doing it. Well, we've rebuked that. Now I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do? All right, I'm going to do it. I don't I, Help me to get it, because I want to be growing wisdom, too. And as I go and step out in obedience, and I do a thing, I am being hammered, stretched out in my stature to hold God's presence. And he is going to build his church. That's the whole point. He says, I'm going to build my church. <clears throat> who will be my body and walk just like I walked. Well, we know we're not there yet, so why aren't we? Because we didn't understand. I didn't. I didn't, under, I didn't have the wisdom to cooperate for increase. I protected my own. I was after. I spent way too much time in acquiring the blessings of God rather than walking out discipleship, knowing the blessings are just following me like a wake in a boat. I don't need to, like, hang on to them. His inventory is filled with them. Just, Lord, I, yep, I need a car, I need groceries, I need money to pay my bills, and what are you asking me to do? 
I'm asking you to go to your neighbors. All right. And the, well, Lord, they slapped me on the face. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I, I understand what I'm doing, and I want you to work with me. Besides, my neighbors haven't slapped me on the face. <clears throat> They're more hungry than I realize. Okay, so I'm moving. I'm going to. We're going to, I'm going to release you in just a second. And he himself, in Ephesians 4, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's, that's, that's the extent to where that word shows up in the New Testament. It shows up with a guy... Uh, in two different Gospels, same, same setting, same word. But other than that, that's where it shows up. So this idea is we will come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We will be hammered out until we have attained a readiness fit for his fullness. And he's in that process right now. And we're growing and growing all the time. And we're getting there and we're getting there. But I really feel like the Lord's saying, if you understand, if you have the wisdom to get it, cooperate and I'll get you there at an accelerated rate. Just stay with me on this, and I will move you along. And I'm not going to talk about equipping is mending and furnishing. There's the idea of pastors, apostles, all those. We help, we help people discover broken areas get, and have them get mended so that they can be folded correctly to be useful to catch fish. So it's both a mending and a preparing and a, and a training and equipping. Um, work of the ministry is doing God's business and stuff like that. But it's interesting where it says, speaking the truth and love may grow up into all things in him who is the head, and then no longer being children tossed to and fro by the trickery and cunningness of men. Those are your wolves. That if we don't grow in stature, we are, we are poised that the cunningness and craftiness of men, are. It's, the idea is, they see Christians like sheep huddled together and they walk around looking for a place to come in. They're cunning. And the idea of cunningness is like a crap game, roll of the dice. It, they, they want the house favor odds to be in their favor. So they're looking at how they can bend the situation to where when I play my hand, I'm likely to win. They're on the hunt. That's the idea. Bad doctrine is on the hunt for people who don't have the stature to carry God's presence. And it's the job of the five Ascension Gift ministers to be working in the body, as the body, but working in the body, shoring us up in sound doctrine, instruction in righteousness, uh, causing us to follow the Lord with a heart of obedience to where he is hammering us out, and saying to people, just because you had a bad week at work, that doesn't mean you failed. It meant God made you stronger through that process. He is shaping you to have, be a person of stature, to carry his presence. The time's going to come when you're going to walk in, and everything's going to change because of the person you bring with you. So stay in the process. Get it. Work with it. And that's what's going on there. And <clears throat> so the idea is, there, we're, not in the, we're not in a benevolent world. There's hell on earth and heaven on earth, and they're commingled, and God is looking for a people who draw upon the resources of heaven to push hell out of the way. There's no such thing as just being neutral. There's no such thing as, well, I'll, I'll pick it up next Sunday. It, it's, you're not. It's not going to happen. We're, we, we never let it go. We stay at it. This podcast is a presentation of Chapel Valley, a community church. More information from Chapel Valley can be found at www.chapelvalley.org.